So um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is just in general kind of my three uh, top favorite option trading strategies. And what's interesting about this is that uh, what I'm talking about tonight actually applies to volatile markets like the markets we're having right now, or even if it's a quiet market, there's not much going on, it's still the same principles apply. One of the main differences between a volatile market and a non-volatile market is simply the average true range that you're dealing with each day. And one of the things I found as a general rule is that if the VIX is trading over 17, I'll generally cut my position size in half and double my stop loss. So why? Well, what's happening is that you're giving your trade a better chance to work out, yet you're risking the same amount of money. Okay, it's that monetary risk is still the same, but you're giving it enough room to survive the volatility that we're experiencing. And it's just you know, a couple things like that that you know, until you go through a volatile market, you don't really know that that's something that should be important to do. So let's dive into this. So we recently did a live event in San Francisco. We do one or two a year. And uh, when I was going to San Francisco, <laughs> and it, this actually applies to Nevada as well because marijuana is legal here. So it says my two hobbies are smoking marijuana and rescuing stray cats. And um, it, it, it's, 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 it's kind of funny for a couple of reasons, but mostly because that's a true photo. <laughs> so the idea with trading is a lot of times, and how many people here are trading without a plan? They're just kind of like, they're just kind of, be honest. You know, I'd say about half, even though two people raise their hands. Um, so the idea with trading, and when I first started trading full time, you know, I worked, uh, corporate America for a while out of college. And during that time, I was really focused on trading. I would miss meetings that interfered with the open and the close, different things like that. The, the ironic thing is that when I started, when I was trading in corporate America, and as my trading got better and better, I became kind of, um, I don't know what the right word is, like obstinate. Like I would uh, skip meetings that interfered with trading. Well, upper management saw that as a sign of independence and they kept promoting me. So I got my own office, <laughs> I could lock the door and I could trade and so it actually worked out. It was a win-win for everybody. But the idea with trading is that everybody's gonna start off with this plan. Typically the plan is, oh, I'm gonna learn some skills and I'm gonna make some money and this is gonna be great. And oftentimes the reality is a lot different. There's things that you don't realize that the market can do to you until you experience those things. And I found that kind of the magic line in the sand is that once you get about three years of trading experience, you've kind of been through enough experiences to realize that there's only two truths in trading. And it is one, you have no idea what's gonna happen next, okay? And two, that's fine. There's no reason to be fearful of what's gonna happen next. Don't focus on the fear of not knowing what's gonna happen next. Just focus on the risk of not knowing exactly what's gonna happen next. Then you focus on position sizing and risk control. You know, the idea here is that you know, people will kind of ask, it's like, gosh, you know, I'd love to have a win ratio of 99%. Well, you can, just you know, if you're trading the S&P futures, have a one tick target and a 100 tick stop. You're gonna win 99% of the time, right? It's just that one time that you don't win, you're gonna lose all your profits. And so it's just really getting comfortable with the idea that all this is is a probabilities game. And if you can get to the point where your setups have about a 75% win ratio and your wins are twice as, bigger than, twice as big as your losses, then this is something that actually turns into a profitable endeavor. So I like this, is the idea here that martyr is not part of your job description. And where I see traders get in trouble the most is that they become married to their idea of what they think should happen next, okay? and they will defend their point of view right up until their broker calls with a margin call request. And the idea was something like this, is that when you get into a trading idea, just the idea that, you know, the more you can disassociate yourself, okay, from the outcome, the better you're gonna be able to do, because then you're gonna be able to take losses without any shame or anger or guilt, and you're gonna be able to move seamlessly through these trades. And so this is a big part of this, as you've been doing this for a while. So one of my mentors, um, I, uh, I've told this story before about um, my last, you know, I, you know, the last time I blew out my account was in the mid 90s. And I, at the time, um, my wife and I, my, the time my fiance, 
she had, and I'll back up. So my fiance and I, we met in college. And so I was sitting there in history class one day and this cute girl next to me was talking about how, you know, she was trying to figure out what to do with the $20,000 that she got from financial aid. She should put it in a checking account or she should put it into savings. And I said, hey babe, I could trade that for you. <laughs> and so, um, she was, so shockingly, she gave me the money and I, at the time, was really into Investor's Business Daily, and I found a stock called iOmega that was trading at $5. I put it all in there. And I remember this trade for a couple of reasons. Um, so the stock went up to $35. I placed a stop loss at 18 and three quarters. It came down to 18 and three quarters, stopped me out, and then went to 300. So the good news is, is that I made her money, and it was a lot. You know, it was like tripled the account. I, you know, I gave her her 5% cut. <laughs> Uh, no. um, but like, I mean, obviously it worked out, which was good. That could have been a horrible nightmare. Today we're married. We just celebrated our 22 year anniversary and we have three kids. So, so far so good. Thank you. And, um, but prior, but at one point while we were um, engaged, there was a situation where I had a job promotion up to Minnesota which was very cold in January. Now Maria was born and bred in Austin, Texas, had never seen snow before. We showed up in Minnesota. It's a blizzard, right? I at least had spent a couple of winters in Nebraska, so I knew what to expect. And at one point around March, she said, look, I love you and everything, but if you would expect me to stay here, we need to get a house with a garage that we can park our cars, because we lived in an apartment and our cars from Texas would not start, so she was trapped in her apartment all day. So at the time, I'd built up a $150,000 trading account. I was still working at Corporate America. I was on the verge of quitting, because I was trying to build confidence that I could do this consistently. And I was every week wiring out a couple thousand dollars, and I got into a nice rhythm. And we decided that we needed to get a house, or she decided that we needed to get a house. I, I acquiesced, and we needed $30,000 for a down payment. Now at this point, the money that I was wiring out, I was putting into rare coins, so they weren't really liquid. So to get that $30,000, I was gonna have to take it from my trading account. And one night about a week before close, I thought, you know what? I really don't wanna take that out of my trading account because I'm in this good rhythm with $150,000. This is how traders think, right? If it goes, if I take out 30 and I get to 120, that's gonna mess me up psychologically. I'm gonna have to try to make that back before I can start creating an income. So I had this great idea that I would just do a really big trade, make $30,000, take my account up to 180, wire out the 30, I'm back at 150, and we all live happily ever after. And the next morning, I am looking at the charts, and at the time I was trading OEX options, and the market was rallying up to a downward trend line. It's like, wow, this was meant to be. And so I bought 100 put options at $7, so that was about half my account. And it immediately started to work, and then it came back up and offered me the opportunity to add to my position. So I bought another uh, 100 at like eight bucks, whatever it was, I just maxed out my entire account. At the close, I was up about $12,000. So I was like, man, all we need is a slight gap down, I'll have my $30,000, and we can all live happily ever after. So the next morning, I turned on CNBC, and you know they have the little Dow Futures pre-market, and there was an up arrow and it said 154 points. Now obviously that was wrong, so I turned off the TV, shook the remote. <laughs> it was indeed up 154 points. Now at this point I'd been trading it enough to know that this wasn't gonna work, but I also knew that most likely it was gonna come down and do half a gap fill and I could get out and I'd lose about $20,000 and say la vie, you know, life goes on. What happened was that the market gapped up, traded sideways all day, rallied into the close, and for the next three days, the market gapped up, rallied sideways, and rallied into the close. And I actually don't have a good memory of this because I <laughs> totally deer in the headlights this whole situation. But what happened was is that I realized that the next day we needed to buy a damn house, so I needed to sell. And so I called up the broker, closed out everything. So at this point, my account balance was about $8,500. This was extremely bad. <laughs> so I did at this point what any soon-to-be husband in their right mind would do, and the first thing is, is I sure as hell did not tell Maria what just happened. <laughs> I did go to the bank and max out all my credit cards to the point where I had enough money sitting in my account that we could buy the house the next day. We went to the closing, 
there was a little hiccup about where the funds had come from. They're like, you said it was gonna be at your trading account, and now it's in your checking account. We need to see where this money came from. And I was like, God, I'm screwed. Um, so I just played stupid, and after about 30 minutes, they were fine, and they let me sign the paperwork, which I couldn't believe, and we owned the house. So I went and dropped Maria off, and then I went, this is now about May, I went to the golf course, and I would just, you know, I, I would play around, and then after I, I hit the ball in, I would go like this and throw up. And then I would go to the next hole and repeat that for nine holes. So, so I had a lot of soul searching to do um, through this period, and I had to decide if this was something I was gonna continue. Now at this point I had bought some real estate, I'd bought some real, rare coins, so I could set up a new account if I wanted to, but I really had to ask myself the question, is this something that I really wanna put my wife through, you know, my kids through someday, where there's these boom and bust cycles, and it's like, that's not, you know, I had to really come to grips with that. So during this time, I met up with a couple of mentors that I met through my broker, and one of them um, was a trader in Atlanta, or outside of Atlanta, and she agreed that I could sit with her for a week. And so here's the things that she taught me. So I hopped on the plane, rented a car. She was near, lived near Augusta where the, where the Masters played. And well, it's funny because when I went there, I actually wasn't sure who the trader was. It was just last name. So she greeted me at the door. She was kind of in her late 50s at the time. I mean, it's like the nicest kindergarten teacher you can imagine. It's like. Oh, hi, are you John? Well, come on in. And, and we sat down and there's this like Formica tabletop with a small TV showing CNBC and then a cathode ray tube showing a 30 minute chart of the S&Ps and the time and sales and then the tick, the NYC tick. And we're talking for about 20 minutes and I started to get a little impatient because I actually wasn't sure if it was she that was the trader or the husband and I didn't see the husband. And so after we're sitting there going back and forth, she just stopped me and said, Can, I know you've got questions, John, but could you wait just a minute? And I was like, oh, sure. And she picked up the phone, ordered 100 S&P futures contracts, and then hung back up. And at that point, she had my undivided attention. <laughs> so what happened with this is that she was a broker with Merrill Lynch for 12 years. And during that time, she watched 95% of her clients who lost money all did the exact same three things. They used market orders, they had stops that were way too tight, and they overtraded. So she decided that when she retired from being a broker, that she was going to trade and do exactly the opposite. And she was going to undertrade, use too wide of stops, okay, and only use limit orders. And so during that day, what happened is that she had her 100 lot on, um, she had a 10 point stop. And the market was up, the market was down, but what she did is instead of staring at every tick, is that after she placed her order and her stop loss, she made me go out into the garden with her. And we gardened for two hours and I was about to blow my brains out. Cause I'm like, what's going on in the markets? So we came back and you know, the S&Ps had been up 15 points, down eight points, and she ended up making two points cause her exit strategy was to get out five minutes before the close. The next day, there was a lot of movement. She didn't do any trades, and I kind of asked her, I was like, well, you know, don't you feel a little foolish? She had a lot of moves there, and you didn't catch any of them. And she's just like, oh, John, you've just got, that's a cute question. Um, and what she told me at that point is she just said, most traders, she's like, traders are not born with the gene of patience. And if you want to be a good trader, you have got to learn patience, or it will never work. And the next day, we sat there, she had her set up, she waited for it, she took it, made like 20 points on 100 contracts in the S&Ps, and then was, well, do you have any more questions, John? I'm like, no, I got it. <laughs> so, so I learned this while, um, you know, the idea here is that patience is not the ability to wait, but how you act while you're waiting. And this is probably, I think, the biggest struggle a lot of, pe a lot of traders have, and if you, can, if you can get this, then the setups I'm gonna show you will have a much better chance of working. And so the last quick story about this, and then we'll dive into uh, actual setups. So there was one, uh, one summer, this was about in 2009, where I have um, my wife's mom's sister's daughter, who was kind of a problem child in high school. 
She hung out with kind of the druggy crowd. She was kind of goth. So she's represented by the middle character here because that's kind of how she dressed. And her mom called me up and said, hey, uh, her name is Adelita. We call her Lita. Could Lita do a summer internship with you? I'm like, that sounds amazing. I mean, like, well, I really want to work with a 15-year-old high school girl who's on drugs and doesn't like authority. That sounds great. But she had babysat her kids a couple times, and, and it was fine. So I taught her to trade Dow Futures. Now, the first two weeks, it didn't work out. And what I realized was that what I was telling her was too complicated. And I needed to be able to have a setup that was so simple, a 15-year-old, questionably drug addict type person could actually follow the setups. And so it really forced me to really clarify and simplify my own trading plan so she got to the point where she had, you know, it was a 500 tick chart, E-mini Dow futures, and a squeeze, which is what I'll show you here in a minute. And she got to the point where she was cranking out trades. Now, what was interesting about this is that during this time, we used to do kind of live mentorships once a quarter. And at this particular time, after she'd been doing this for about two months, we had five people come into the office. It was a doctor, a doctor, a doctor, a doctor, and then a medical malpractice attorney. So it was a really interesting group. And they sat there and on the first day, you know, they made some money and Lita was over here trading and she lost like $50. And then they kind of come over here and they were telling her all these different things that she was doing wrong. Again, imagine a 15 year old goth chick with hair in her eyes was like, you know, you kill me, kill me. Like she did not want to be talking to these people. On the second day though, they all lost money and she made $1,000. And on the third day, they just walked right past my desk and they sat with her all day, which was great. But what she learned to do unknowingly, but I always remembered this, is that once she had a defined setup, she set an alert. And if there was nothing to do, she just played online Scrabble. She didn't sit there staring at the markets looking for something to do. And she sat there playing online Scrabble and when she heard the alert, then she took action and she followed her plan. So I was fascinated by that because of all, you know, and at the end of the summer, she had a $10,000 account that was $18,000 after 90 days. So I did the right thing. I gave her 50 bucks and told her good luck. <laughs> I gave her more than that, but um, anyway, so it was, it was interesting stuff there. So let's talk about strategies. So option strategy number one, which is essentially contrary larger trends that are at work. So the idea here that we have these big moves like in October that they're out of the blue is a misnomer if you know what to look for. The big moves that are out there are always setting up behind the scenes, but you've got to know where to look and what to measure. And I like these trades because they're far out, simple, and cheap, okay? And that was kind of like my homecoming date in my sophomore year. So let's take a look. Usually in Vegas, that gets a bigger laugh, but that was, I may have, I may have screwed up the delivery. Um, so the first thing I look at is the skew. Now, I, these charts that I have are mostly trade station. I use TradeStation and Thinkorswim, so I'll tell you the symbols. Um, TradeStation, it's dollar sign S-K-E-U dot X. On Thinkorswim, it's just dollar, I think it's dollar sign S-K-E-W. By the way, I'll have a link after this to give you a copy of these slides. The short version of the SKU is that if it's over 135, above the line there, the simplified version of what that means is that hedge funds and fund managers see that the odds of a two standard deviation correction have increased to the point where they need to up the protection of their portfolios. Okay, what does this mean? It means they're driving up the put prices on the SPX and the NDX, and this is being reflected in the SKU. Now, if you think about this, when a hedge fund or a fund is nervous that the market is going the odds have increased for a two standard deviation correction, we wanna to listen to them because they have way better research than we're going to be able to get, okay? The opposite of this is true, is if the skew is under 120, at that point the funds see the lowest probability event that we're gonna have a correction, and in fact, they're being prepared for a rally. Okay, so what does this mean and how do we use this? So if you look at this, back here, so, um, this was up here. So back all through October, the SKU was not only over 135, it was trading around 140, okay? When we see something like this, it's hard for me to get excited about the long side, even though the market continued to rally. 
you see something like this, it's like, man, the hedge funds are really nervous here, so I need to have something in place to take advantage of this. And then you can see eventually what happened here, of course, is we had the correction in October. Now, when we got down to the low here, what happened is the skew went under 125, and when it goes under 125, it's the opposite, okay? What's great about this is that when things look the rosiest, at some point, this is going to tell you it's when you should be the most careful on the long side. And the opposite side of the coin is when things look like it's a disaster and you're like, man, I should start shorting now. The SKU is telling you, no, you should actually start buying. So it really keeps you on the right side of that emotional roller coaster. And right now, the SKU is actually still very low and still focused on that the odds of an upside rally from where we are right now, even though it looks like a disaster, is much higher than a two standard deviation correction from where we are right now. So that's one of the things that I like to look at. The other thing I like to look at is the 10 day moving average of the combined equity and index put call ratio. On TradeStation, that symbol is cash sign PCVA. On Thinkorswim, it is cash sign PCALL. Okay, I don't know what it is on other platforms, but all you gotta do is look up the combined equity and index put call ratio. What happens with this and why it works is because if you're only looking at the index options, they're always gonna be skewed towards um, put buying because they're used as hedges. If you're only looking at equity, call, equity put call ratios, they're always gonna be skewed towards excessive call buying because essentially retail traders like to buy calls. But if you look at the combined amount, it's gonna give you some extremely good intelligence for one specific thing, okay? And the idea is this. Uh, I don't know if there's any sci-fi fans in here. Is anybody like the, you know, it was the newer version of Battlestar Galactica that came out on the sci-fi channel? I thought it was awesome, it was great. But if you imagine that there was a nuclear holocaust and there's only 50,000 of us left and we're all on a spaceship, but luckily the markets still worked and we could trade. Um, <laughs> so we'd have something to do. And if uh, all of us liked Apple, okay, and all of us were long Apple, what's Apple gonna do? There's no more buyers for Apple. Apple's gonna start falling and start taking out stops. So the people that are the most nervous and have the tightest stops, Apple's gonna hit that. That's gonna create selling that goes down to the next stops, the next stops, and the next stops. Now we don't have that perfect scenario in today's markets, but the put call ratio is the closest thing we're gonna get. So if the 10 day moving average of the put call ratio is over one, it is the equivalent at this point of that everybody in the market is short and there's no one else left to short. So if there's no one else left to short, what's gonna happen? The market's gonna start taking out all the buy stops. So here it was over one, you can see that this was, of course, this was back in November of 2017. Things were looking shaky. You can see that we start to rally. The other side of the coin is that if we get to 0.75 or below, it's the same as everybody being long. If everyone is long, there's no one else left to buy, what happens? The market rolls over and dies, okay? So you can see here, boom. And then um, if we look at it more recently, uh, back in, June, we got to a point where the market had been rallying, rallying, rallying. Everybody is long. Is my mouse, yeah, okay, my mouse pointer's there. At this point, everybody's long. If everybody's long, it's setting us up for a correction. This happened to be a small correction, but if you saw this and you understood how to read it and what to look for, you knew at this point you really didn't want to be long. You could be flat and wait for the dip, or you could actually establish some shorts. Same thing here, as we were coming into October, here we are, the 10 day moving average of the put call ratio, down here again, everybody's long, and if everybody's long and no one else is left to buy, we do not want to be long, okay? It's the wrong side of the market. Again, doesn't mean you need to short, but at least have some hedges in place, at least get some cheap protection on there. Now, what was interesting is that, okay, so boom, we're falling, we're falling, we're falling, so right about the time where we hit our lows, Okay, and right now, um, the NAS, the NDX is trading right about, eh, it's, you know, right about here right now. But right about the time we're hitting the lows, and the news on, the tel on TV was horrible, and the, um, you know, everything looked like it was the end of the world. The 10-day moving average of the put-call ratio goes over one. That means that, guess what? 
everybody now that's short is short, and from there we had this huge rally. It doesn't mean it's gonna be a rally that takes us to new highs, but we had this blistering short covering rally from last week. So that's the kind of stuff that can help us be prepared for these bigger moves. So what do we do with this? So this is a very easy strategy. All you're doing is buying calls or buying puts, 60 to 90 days out, delta 30. Okay, what delta 30 means is it's out of the money. I typically prefer buying in the money options and we will be buying in the money options on the next setup. Um, it's totally okay to buy in the money options on this, but you don't need to. You can actually take a small amount of risk. Um, I would not buy options that are a week out. You gotta give them time because you don't know exactly when the thing's gonna roll over or when it's gonna bottom. So my strategy with this is when the skew is over 135, and again, you can take a picture of this, feel free, or at the end of this, I'll show you a link where you can get this presentation. When the skew is over 135, then in my portfolio, I wanna have some puts on the spiders, okay, or it could be the SPX, um, it could be the Qs, it could be the NDX, whatever, whatever you like there. But I wanna have some puts 60 to 90 days out at a delta 30, okay? That means these are out of the money, they're pretty cheap, you're not gonna worry about them too much. I'm targeting a 200% return, okay? If I'm buying these at one, then I, I'm looking for them to go to three, or that the skew drops below 130. Sometimes we've done this and they go up five, six, seven times. Sometimes we do it and they're up 50% and then the skew drops, all right? And then we just get out. So it's an either or scenario, either the skew drops below, you know, and you can sell half, you know, sell half if you get 200% and then wait for the, like that. When the skew is under 120, it's just the opposite. I'm gonna buy 60 to 90 the out delta 30 call options with the same strategy, okay? Now the nice thing about the 10 day moving average of the put call ratio, it's the same thing. If it's over one, meaning that um, at the, it's, you know, it's a negative market, at this point everybody's short, great. That's when I wanna be buying out of the money calls 60 to 90 days out. You don't wanna buy out of the money calls when the market has been rallying and looks fantastic. When it looks the best is the worst time to buy, okay? When it looks the worst, you can actually get in and you can get an edge, okay? Um, so same thing there. So again, you, I'll write this down, take a picture, et cetera, et cetera. So the other thing that falls into this first core series of setups is the relationship of the daily VIX with its Bollinger Bands, all right? One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is that you know, the VIX will explode higher, the markets are selling off, and then people ask, should I be hedging now? It's like, it's too late, the move's already happening. So to hedge, what you wanna do is when the VIX is at the bottom of the Bollinger Band, which is when the market looks at its, its absolute best, when the last thing on your mind is hedging, okay? But if we're down here at the lower Bollinger Band, there's really nowhere for it to go but up, and if the VIX is going up, which way is the market going? Down. So an easy, easy hedging strategy here is when the, Bollinger, when the VIX, daily VIX is the lower Bollinger Band, then that's the time to start looking at some put options, okay, or some calls on the VXX or whichever way, you, you know, long VIX futures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here's a, you know, kind of a scoped out version of it. One of the things I'm gonna talk about too is what a squeeze is. Typically, if the VIX gets so quiet that there's a squeeze, it typically means we're gonna actually have a bigger than expected move and it's the kind that can blow through um, those kind of a Bollinger Bands. So, Okay, look at times. So, so the strategy with this is very similar. So when the VIX is at the lower Bollinger Band, we're gonna be buying 60 day out Delta 30 spider puts, targeting a 100% return or a move to the upper band. If it goes to the upper band, you're typically looking at a triple. If you're familiar with the VIX, this is actually a great time to buy calls on the VIX or even better, do a VIX call debit spread because the premium on those out of the money calls on the VIX is so expensive. So like if the VIX is 12, I could buy that at the money $12 call, sell the $15 call. Typically you can do that for about 80 cents uh, against a max gain of three bucks. So it's a really good risk to reward ratio, okay? All right, so let's dive into strategy number two. Well, and the idea with this too, is that if you're, 
keyed in to these key levels, okay, that measure basically psychology, you're also going to be on the right side of this, okay? And what happens a lot of times is if we're unconscious about what's going in the markets, right? The market's going to suck us into this routine where we buy when things look good. Like, oh my God, I'm going to buy here. Now I'm thrilled. I'm experiencing euphoria. How much money am I going to make on this trade? And then it starts to come down. And when it comes down, the immediate thing is, okay, well, because psychology really screws up traders in this area. I'll get out when I get back to where I was, right? Well, that has nothing to do with it. The market doesn't care, right? If, you're, if you are paddling a surfboard in the ocean, the ocean doesn't even know you're there. It's going to send you little waves. It's going to send you big waves. But it has nothing to do with you. It's just the ocean is going to do what the ocean does. And it's the same thing with the market. The market's going to do what the market does. It doesn't know that you exist, although sometimes it feels like it's coming after your stops, right? So then you go through this, you know, panic, capitulation. And one of the things I like to think about is that I like my entry to be somebody else's panic, okay? And if you think about that, I always think about, you know, you know, the trades that have cost me the most emotional turmoil were the ones where I kept hanging on and hanging on, and by the time I finally capitulated, it seemed like the markets magically bottomed, right, and rallied. Well, it's because there's a lot of people going through the same thing, and once it flushes out everybody, it's ready to rally. So it's kind of, that was uh, Danielle when she was doing her first trade, and now she's got that under control. So, so strategy number two, um, for those of you that trade options, are you familiar with the concept of expected moves and greater than expected moves? So the expected move is essentially what's already priced in. So a lot of times, you know, if you've ever bought a call prior to earnings, in like on Apple, and Apple goes up five bucks and you wonder why you don't make any money, it's because that move is already priced in to the option. So the best way to make money is if you're long a call or long a put, is that you identify a moment in time in the markets where you have a greater than expected move. So if the market makers have priced in the option for a $3 move, but you see, which is gonna happen 70% of the time, right? Statistics, one standard deviation. Where you're gonna actually be able to make the most money is if you can identify the moments in time where there's an increased probability of a greater than expected move. So instead of there's a $3 move priced in and it stays within $3, that there's a $5 move, or a $6 move, or a $10 move. So the strategy I like to do with this, and these are all indicators that are, should be on any platform that you have, is I use three tools. I use Bollinger Bands at a setting of 2.0, I just default. So 2.0 and 20. Um, Bollinger Bands measure standard deviations. And then I use the Keltner Channels, the Keltner channels measure the average true range, and I use the default setting. Uh, it's 1.5, it's right there, 1.5 and 20. And then I'm also just using a basic momentum oscillator. So what I'm looking for here is that what I noticed is that when, um, it's kind of like the idea is like if you imagine an Olympian, they run a 200 yard dash, okay? And then after the 200 yard dash, they don't immediately go do another race. They have to sit down, drink some electrical, electrolytes, rest and relax, and build up their energy for the next move. And this, it is the same with the stock market no matter what time frame you're trading, okay? And what this does is it measures those times that the market is essentially building up energy and is now has enough energy that it can do its next race. Okay, so how specifically do we isolate this? So what we're looking for are moments in time when the Bollinger Bands, which contract, contract, contract and expand with volatility, we're looking for moments in time when the Bollinger Bands have contracted to the point where they're now trading inside of the Keltner channels, okay? So it's essentially that the, you know, the more complicated way to say that is that the standard, the two standard deviation range has contracted to the point where now it's trading inside of the average two range, okay? Regardless, it's easy to identify on the chart. When the red bands are inside of the blue bands, that's telling us that the volatility on this stock or this market on this time frame, whether it's a five minute chart or a monthly chart, has contracted to the point where it actually cannot build up any more energy and it actually has to release that energy, okay? 
The energy being released is signified when the Bollinger Bands pop back out of the Keltner channels. And you can see at that point, you typically have a release of energy. If at that time, the momentum oscillator is above zero, there's an 80% chance that that release of energy is gonna to be to the upside, okay? And you can see that it's typically a fairly big move. It's almost always a greater than expected move. So um, as an indicator, to make this a little bit more visually appealing, we have what's called the TTM squeeze, all right? This is actually available on many platforms. So when you see the red dots here at the bottom, that is telling you that the Bollinger Bands are inside of the Keltner channels, okay? For me, visually, it's a little easier to see. The signal is when you get the first green dot after the series of red dots, that's your signal to take a trade. If the histogram is above zero, it's a long trade. So in this case, if you're trading options, buy a call, all right? If you're a more advanced options trader and you understand spreads, you can sell a put credit spread. Sell an in the money put credit spread, which is even higher probability because you've got theta decay in your favor. The trade typically lasts eight to 10 bars, no matter what time frame you're trading. If it's a daily chart, eight to 10 bars means it's about an eight to 10 day trade. If it's a weekly chart, that means it's about an eight to 10 week trade. If it's an hourly chart, about an eight to 10 hour trade. Um, one minute chart, eight to 10 minute trade. So the great thing is same principles apply no matter what time frame you're trading. The trade is over when you get two uh, loss, you get a loss of momentum. Okay, you can see it on there, which is indicated in this case by the darker colored bars, okay? When that happens, the trade is over and you can exit. So um, if you guys use Thinkorswim, you can actually just go into studies. There's a section there called John Carter studies and there's a squeeze and you can just add it to your charts. So, so here's an example of what I mean by expected moves versus greater than expected moves. So here's the red dots. You can see that Home Depot here was trading in a nice range. We get the first green dot, the momentum's above zero. It's a long, we get in, and you can see the stock rallies from about $165 to $185 before it loses the momentum. For an option trader that's long calls here, that's great because it doesn't even really lose momentum, right? Of course, you could sell a put credit spread here. Um, I, so I love selling put credit spreads. The only time I don't love it is when I get a move like that. You know, it's like, man, I sold a put credit spread for a dollar. If I had bought a call, you know, it'd be up 5X, but that's okay. So, <clears throat> so my general rule of thumb here is that I, if I, you know, this is a daily chart of Home Depot in this case. We'll look at a bearish example as well. Generally, I like to see at least five red dots before I take action, okay? Now, one question I'll get asked is like, hey, if there's more dots, does that mean the move is gonna be more powerful? And you would think that that would be the case, but it's not. A one dot squeeze can be just as powerful as a 10 dot squeeze. But the reality of it is, is a one dot squeeze is hard to find and capture. So I usually don't catch those because I just, I'm like, oh, it already happened, I missed it. But if there's five dots, I know there's a nice buildup of energy. If it's gonna be a long trade, I like to see that the moving averages are stacked positive. Doesn't really matter which ones you use. I use the eight, 21, 34, 55, and 89. Uh, those are all written down on another slide. But those are um, Fibonacci sequential numbers. So if they're all stacked positive, the eight's on top of the 21, which is on top of the 34, which is on top of the 55, which is on top of the 89, and price is above the 21, I will get into the trade long before it fires, okay? That's just, it's teed up and ready to go. And typically on something like this, whereas on the other strategies, I was talking about buying out of the money options 60 to 90 days out, I prefer in this case buying in the money options, typically delta 70. And in terms of expiration, I'm always taking into account the time frame that I'm looking at, okay? So if it's a daily chart and I'm buying it, you know, right here, five dots in, and I know it typically lasts eight to 10 bars, I'll typically go 30 days out on the option. Why 30 days? Well, I don't know when it's gonna fire, okay? And then two, the further out you go, the less premium decay you're gonna have to deal with, all right? Now, if you've been trading options, obviously you could do a call debit spread. You can do a put credit spread. 
Um, there's a lot of different things that you could do, but it's nice because this is a simple strategy where you could just buy a call. And the idea is because we're getting, setting up for some momentum in a greater than expected move, the theta decay isn't that big of a deal. The theta decay hurts you is when it's just sitting there trading sideways. So, so what about the downside? So the other thing I like to look at too is looking at patterns. And so, you know, I'm a big believer that markets typically move in a thrust and reaction type cycle where they're always reverting back to the mean. And then from that level, they're doing their next thrust. If it's an uptrend, obviously to the upside. If it's in a downtrend, then to the downside. So a lot of times this happens to be Amazon. And a lot of times people will kind of look at it and say, well, you know, you draw those lines and it looks good in hindsight. But in reality, stock charts are messy and they don't really play out like that. But the reality of it is if you look at this and just say, okay, well, let's draw the lines. Thrust, reaction, thrust, reaction, thrust, reaction, thrust, reaction, thrust, which is a lower high, and then we puke. Well, it, hey, that's a classic topping pattern. Thrust, reaction, thrust, reaction, thrust, reaction that retests the lows, you know, it's a head and shoulders top. So when you see this stuff and then you see a squeeze forming, okay, so again, another setup that I like, if you see a reversal pattern and you're familiar with head and shoulders and you see a squeeze lining up with that third, that shoulder, okay, you're typically looking at a reversal. So here we had the rally, here's a squeeze, okay, but this is the right shoulder of a head and shoulders pattern. Typically, this is gonna resolve itself to the downside. Of course, Amazon did the big puke. What's interesting right now is we do have some squeezes setting up in some of the indexes as we're forming a reverse head and shoulders pattern. So we're watching how that will play out. Um, but same thing here, you can see squeeze, explosion, right? Squeeze, explosion, squeeze, explosion. So I always wanna know when and where there is a squeeze, okay? All right, so let's get to, so we already covered that because I got one more that I wanna make sure that we cover. Um, so here's the thing. So. For Home Depot on Thinkorswim, it tells you what the expected move is. So $3, $4, but when there's a squeeze, the market makers do not know that they need to take this into account. And frankly, they never will because they base everything on the VIX, which is pricing out what's gonna happen 30 days from today versus what's happening right now. So yeah, if there's no squeeze that's fired, we are gonna trade in the expected move. And that's when you're doing premium selling and stuff like that. But when the squeeze sets up, boom, greater than expected move. The beauty of this is when you have a greater than expected move, all the market makers are short the expected move. So when it blows through that, they actually need to cover their short options, which pushes the market up even more. The beauty of this is you can not understand it at all, and it's great. When there's red dots, buy an option. <laughs> when it loses momentum, get out. You actually don't need to understand the mechanics behind it. What's beautiful about this is that this is perfect for buying options because you wanna buy options when the volatility is low, which is what happens when there's red dots. And then when it releases, you're not only getting intrinsic value, but you're also getting premium expansion because of the big move. So it's a win-win. Okay, so we got that and we got that again. I'll give you guys these slides. Okay, so strategy number three is selling premium after the squeeze is over. So once the squeeze is over, the stock quiets down, goes back into the expected move range, and that is a great time to start collecting premium and income for your account while you're waiting for the next squeeze to set up, okay? So what does that look like? So part of what's happening right now, this is a monthly chart of the S&P futures. And when you start realizing that this is how the market works, it can really change your game. So back here in July of 2012, we had a two dot monthly squeeze on the monthly chart. Remember, when you get a signal like that, you're looking at eight to 10 bars, which is eight to 10 months. When you get something like that, you are hugging that upper Bollinger Band until you get two bars in a row that lose momentum, okay? From there, you trade sideways. And it can be violently sideways, but it's still sideways. We had another squeeze, monthly squeeze, that released at the beginning of 2017. Ah. We rallied, we hugged that upper band, up the band. This is why you don't short a rally to the upper band when there's a squeeze, right? The squeeze is designed to push prices higher. You're hugging that upper band, hugging that upper band. But once the squeeze loses momentum, we're going back, we're gonna go back to two to three years now of sideways chop in the S&Ps and potentially down movement. 
All right? If you're using strategies that worked here and you didn't know what was going on, you know, it's hard to adjust. The market has changed and you have to adapt accordingly. So a strategy now for this is going back to a daily chart. Here's, um, is that Red Hat? I think so. Or, yes. So um, here's the squeeze, right? So we got a good move, good move, good move. What happens when you have two bars in a row that indicate a loss of momentum? We just start trading sideways. Well, this is a great time to sell strangles, sell iron condors, sell straddles, sell put credit spreads, anything that's theta positive. You do not want to be theta negative in this situation because we're not going to be moving anywhere. The market's going back to moving within its expected range. And when it's doing that, you want to be on the same side as the market makers and they are selling premium. You can see here, even after this big move here, right, we just go sideways after that. So what I do here is once the squeeze is over, okay, I like to sell delta 30 either strangles, okay, and if I'm doing a strangle, I like to do it on a stock like Apple because I'm not going to wake up and Apple is going to get taken over, right? It's a trillion dollar company. Um, but if you're doing naked strangles on a, you know, uh, you know, there's days that you wake up and Red Hat gets taken over for $40 a share higher, right? If you've got naked calls on that, you're dead. So most of the time I like to err on the side of safety and do iron condors. If you don't know what that is, all you're doing is you're selling a, instead of selling a naked call, you're selling a call and then buying a call above it to limit your risk. That's all it is. But if it's Apple, I don't mind like, or, you know, selling a strangle or if it's the S&Ps, I don't mind selling a strangle. And then what I do this, this now is that I actually go out about two weeks, 10 days to 15 days. And then if I, whatever I sell the premium for, I place a good till cancel order just to buy it back at 80% of its max profit. All right. So if I sell it for a dollar, I'm going to place an order to buy it back for 20 cents. If I sell it for $2, I'm going to place an order to buy it back for 40 cents. It's kind of a set it and forget it kind of a trade. Don't make the mistake of letting it, hoping it'll expire worthless. Okay, at that point, if you've got 10 cents left, the risk you're taking is insane. For that last 10 cents, you're risking all this, and that could happen on a Friday. There's a good saying in trading, you should write this down and put it on your computer, and it's don't lose your ass on a Friday. Okay, because if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong on a Friday. That's why you're getting out at 80% of max profit. Yes, it's, I love watching options I sell expire worthless because that's revenge for all the times that I bought options that went to zero at the beginning of my career, but it's stupid, as my kids would say. So use your judgment on that. I find these days I like my life to be fairly easy. I buy them back and I'm done. Five minutes? Is that it? Are we done? Okay. Oh, you mean, is this where the uh, poker tournament is? No, you'll make that when you're done. <laughs> okay. Wait, gotcha, okay. Okay, so we got that. All right, so here's uh, the best thing I can tell you after doing this for a long time is that if you have to look at a chart for more than about three tenths of a second, and after three tenths of a second, you're not quite sure what to do. There is nothing to do, okay? When you have a good setup that's defined, like the squeeze, when you see it, it stands out immediately. And you immediately understand that this is a setup worth following. If you do not have that immediate reaction, put the mouse down, okay? The problem in trading is that as traders, we feel like we need to be trading, right? Remember my 15-year-old niece slash cousin or whatever she is? Um, <laughs> when she did not have her alert for the specific strategy that she was following, she minimized the screen, did not watch the chart, and she played Scrabble. Some days she played Scrabble all day because there was never a set, you know, there was never a setting. And it's by accident one of the smartest things I've ever seen anybody do. Because if you look at a chart long enough, you will be able to find a trade, okay? But that does not mean in any way, shape, or form that you should take it. So as a trader, we always, traders have the toughest time taking losses because psychologically there's a lot of childhood, pardon my French, bullshit, shame, regret, and things like that that can get drudged up with losses. But remember, if you're gonna do this, your job is to kill your trades that are not working. Every Friday I have a ritual. Any trades that are not positive, I just cut them loose. 
I can always get back into them on Monday, but the best loss to take is the first one. So if you would like a copy of this, um, you can just go to here to simplertrading.com forward slash John. Uh, just put in your name and email. You can download the slides right there. Um, we've got one quick announcement. So um, Dennis Gartman, if you, uh, I actually love all the economic stuff that he talks about. He is going to be doing a keynote here uh, right after this at 645. So if you want to see what the state of the economy is, uh, which, by the way, I, I think is going to be going to shit in about nine months, I am pretty sure that Dennis is not wildly bullish on the markets, but I might be wrong. But I'd like to stick around and see that. Um, otherwise, um, you can go here. You can get a copy of my slides. Um, I will exit the stage and be back there to answer questions. Otherwise, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your stay here. Thank you.